In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1986 prospectus for Microsoft, which became publicly traded after its IPO in March of that year. Based on the offering price of $21 per share, the company had a total valuation of $519 million at this time. Adjusted for inflation, that would be a valuation of just under $1.5 billion in today's dollars. Times sure have changed. Plenty of hyped up tech companies went public at much higher valuations in recent years. Uber and Snowflake are two examples that come to mind. Uber had a valuation of around $75 billion when it went public, and Snowflake was valued at over $60 billion. Neither of these companies were profitable enterprises at the time. Microsoft was a different story. My initial reaction when reading Microsoft's prospectus was that the financials were a thing of beauty. The company had 78% gross margins and they were rising. Pre-tax margins were 30%. Revenue grew by 44% in its last full year before the IPO, while net income increased by 52%. The return on beginning equity was 78% in 1985. I would really enjoy owning a company that posted these type of financials. This was a fast-growing, highly profitable company that needed little capital to operate. Despite this growth and profitability, the valuation was modest by today's standards. Based on the offering price at the time of the IPO, Microsoft had a valuation of $519 million. The company earned $24.1 million in the previous year, which means it had a valuation of 22 times earnings. If you annualize the first six months of 1986, then Microsoft went public at a valuation of 15 times earnings. Not too pricey in my opinion, given the beautiful financials and the growth it had been posting. This was a company that didn't really need to inject much more capital into the business. Bill Gates had talked in the past about being reluctant to take his company public. In the end, the main reason for this prospectus and for going public was that Microsoft compensated many employees with stock options. It would have been nearly impossible to use this incentive structure as a private company. Microsoft was founded in 1975, so it had been around for a decade already by the time it went public. The company got its start by providing software to the MITS Altair, which was the first commercially available personal computer. The success of this software helped put Microsoft on the map, and it was able to develop relationships with new customers. Microsoft licensed its software to other computer manufacturers, including Apple Computer. Importantly, When IBM was planning its launch into the personal computer business, Microsoft was one of the companies it approached to find an operating system. IBM was moving quickly and wanted to outsource certain components, including the operating system software. Instead of writing the code from scratch, Microsoft decided to buy 86 DOS, which stood for Disk Operating System, from a company called Seattle Computer Products. Microsoft modified it and rebranded it as MS-DOS, which stood for Microsoft Disk Operating System. I'll talk more about this later, but this was a crucial development for both IBM and Microsoft. IBM's computers ended up being very popular, and Microsoft's software became the standard. Consumers who might not have been computer experts eventually began to understand how to use Microsoft's operating system. So when competitors to IBM wanted to create their own personal computers, they went to Microsoft to provide the software. IBM introduced its personal computer in 1981, and this prospectus notes that IBM had been a leader in the sale of microcomputers since that time. In 1982, Microsoft introduced its first application software program, called the Microsoft Multiplan Electronic Worksheet. Developing applications would be a very important step for the company. Microsoft Word was launched in 1983, 
followed by Microsoft Excel in 1985. Another development that occurred in 1985 was that Microsoft Windows was launched. The prospectus states that Windows was a graphical operating environment that runs on the Microsoft MS-DOS operating system. It is fascinating to see how Word, Excel, and Windows continued to be so popular and so important many decades later. The prospectus describes Microsoft's sources of revenue. Quote, There are two basic categories of microcomputer software, system software and application software. System software can be divided into two subcategories, operating systems and languages. Operating systems control the hardware, allocate computer memory, schedule the execution of application software, and manage the flow of information and communication among the various components of the microcomputer system. Microcomputer language programs, which contain instructions regarding the syntax and rules of a particular computer language, allow the user to write programs in a particular computer language and translate programs into a binary, machine-readable set of commands, which activate and instruct the hardware. End quote. Microsoft created system software as well as application software. When the prospectus mentions applications, it is referring to products like Microsoft Word and Excel. The prospectus goes on to discuss how Microsoft distributed its products. This part is interesting. It says that, quote, Microsoft markets and distributes its software products domestically and internationally through both the OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer, and retail channels. In the OEM channel, Microsoft generally provides an OEM with master copies of the software and documentation, which the OEM duplicates, packages, and distributes. Although there is increasing OEM marketing of Microsoft's package language and application products, end quote. That passage describes a business with beautiful economics. Microsoft needs to spend money on engineers to build software products up front, but then there are extremely low marginal costs afterwards. The company employed 998 people at this time, with 271 employees working in software development. Microsoft spent $17 million on what they call product development and enhancement activities, which amounted to 12% of revenues in 1985. Management believed that this 12% of revenue figure would roughly be the expense necessary going forward. I'm sure there is plenty of investment in research and development that ends up being wasted. Even the best organization will experiment and won't have a 100% hit rate on projects. A man named John Wanamaker, who was in the retail business, once said that, quote, Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half, end quote. I have a feeling that something similar could probably be said of research and development. So Microsoft did have some upfront investment here, but afterwards things turned interesting. Microsoft just had to provide a master copy of the software to the computer manufacturer. Microsoft didn't have to pay for millions of floppy disks or CDs to be manufactured for customers. Once it developed its software, it basically was able to gain distribution at little to no marginal cost. The OEM duplicated, packaged, and distributed the product for Microsoft. An excellent investor named Monish Pabrai wrote about this in his book called The Dondo Investor. I'm just going to read an excerpt from that book as he described the economics of Microsoft well. Quote, A single copy of Microsoft Office is sent to Dell to load onto Dell PCs. Each time Dell loads Office on any machine, it sends Redmond, Washington a few hundred dollars. There are hundreds of millions of copies made all over the planet, yielding billions upon billions every year for Microsoft. The return on invested capital is out of sight and the gross margin approaches 100%, end quote. The relationships that Microsoft built early on with computer manufacturers was crucial. 
availability of a product can be a powerful thing. You are more likely to drink Coca-Cola when it is available at every single restaurant and retail establishment that you go to, instead of having to seek out the one location where it is served. Microsoft's products were available on the most popular computers. This helped introduce Microsoft to consumers, leading to knowledge and comfortability of how to use the product. Once this position was established, competing computer manufacturers wanted Microsoft's products on their computers as well. This was a frictionless experience for many users of Microsoft's products. Even if Microsoft had the best product by far, many computer users would just go with whatever software was pre-installed on their computers. If people had to drive to a store to find the product, make a separate purchase, and then install the software on their computers, then Microsoft would have had more of an uphill battle. To be clear, Microsoft was able to sell some products in this fashion. However, many computers were built with Microsoft software inside of it, both in terms of an operating system as well as applications, leading to less friction for customers and a better position for the company. Up to this point, it was great that Microsoft was intertwined with computer manufacturers. There was some risk here, though. If IBM developed its own operating system or decided to switch suppliers, then Microsoft could face some trouble. Additionally, a competitor who did not use any Microsoft products could emerge and could knock off IBM as a top computer manufacturer, leading to a decline in Microsoft's market share. The prospectus says that, quote, the company's reputation in the microcomputer industry is partially based on its position as a major supplier of system software to many microcomputer OEMs. And if MS-DOS were to lose its position as the most widely used operating system for the IBM PC and IBM compatibles, it could adversely affect the company's relationship with its customers, end quote. Further down in the section on risks, the prospectus notes that price has not been a major factor in the software market. That is excellent news for software companies like Microsoft. That could change though, which was definitely a risk. With hindsight, this prospectus looks like a great opportunity. But this right here is another example of how difficult it might have been to predict the changes ahead in the industry. The prospectus says, quote, it seems likely to management, however, that price competition with its attendant reduced profit margins will emerge in the next few years as a significant consideration. The recent increase of site licenses, permitting copying of the program and documentation, and discount pricing for large volume retail customers is evidence of such competition, end quote. By the time Microsoft went public, the financials looked great, and the valuation was reasonable. The important question would be related to how the business would look 5, 10, or 20 years into the future. This would have been difficult for many investors to forecast back in 1986. Would another competitor emerge? Would Microsoft maintain its leading position with the OEMs? Would pricing become more difficult, like management predicted in the prospectus? Microsoft had relationships with 100 OEM customers domestically at this time, as well as 80 abroad. This could always change, though. The prospectus was clear that Microsoft's industry faced rapid changes in technology and that new products needed to be developed. Would Microsoft adapt to technological changes and continue to compete aggressively now that it was on top? The prospectus talks about product development, and there are clearly some risks in this area. Quote, The microcomputer software industry is characterized by rapid technological change, which requires a continuous high level of expenditures for the enhancement of existing products and development of new products. The company is committed to the creation of new products and intends to continue the enhancement of its existing products. End quote. 
Rapid technological change is something that has wiped out plenty of companies. A business might pass the test a time or two and survive a wave of technological change, but it is extremely difficult to do so consistently over many decades. Expenditures will be needed to enhance or improve existing products, and plenty of research and development will be needed to stay on top of the latest trends and changes in the industry. Daily life has changed quite a bit since 1986 for the average consumer. Computers were a rare novelty when Bill Gates was starting out, and now every American has a supercomputer in their pocket at all times. How is Microsoft able to maintain its successful position for so many decades? This was partially due to culture. Microsoft has been able to adapt to many industry changes. It has been a fast follower on many technological advancements, keeping up with major trends in related fields. The company created an environment where quality engineers not only wanted to work, but wanted to compete vigorously with the competition. In an interesting interview from the early 1990s from the National Museum of American History, Smithsonian Institution, Bill Gates talked about competition a bit. Quote, Interviewer, how did the competition rank in these early days? And how did you manage to continue to make the progress against your competition? Bill Gates, they didn't take quite the same long-term approach that we did, doing multiple products, really being able to hire people and train them to come in and do great work, taking a worldwide approach, thinking of how various products could work together. So we were more comprehensive. We weren't the largest. There was a time that MicroPro and WordStar were bigger. There was a time when BusyCorp was bigger. There was a time when Lotus, with the early years of 123's incredible success, was bigger than we were. But we were always the most technical. Whenever anyone else in the software industry wanted to know where we thought things were going, they'd come and talk to us. Because our vision, we shared. We didn't view that as some competitive edge. We just wanted to talk about it and get other people to share the same ideas so that they would help make it all come true. End quote. That was an interesting response by Gates. Microsoft had more of a long-term approach. They were more comprehensive, and he says they were always the most technical. I believe these were important reasons why Microsoft was able to sustain success for the long term. On top of all this, the company just had a competitive drive to continue improving products and continue adapting. And I think this has to come from the founder at the top. There were a couple more risks listed in the prospectus that caught my eye. These risks had the potential to be very important for the company going forward, at least compared to the size of the overall company at the time. The first was a lawsuit from Seattle Computer Products. This was the firm that sold Microsoft the operating system that eventually Microsoft put into the IBM microcomputer. Supplying IBM was a pivotal moment for the company, so if there was any merit behind a lawsuit from that event, it would be important. The prospectus says, quote, Microsoft was served in January 1986 with a summons and complaint in an action commenced by Seattle Computer Products, Inc., SCP in the Superior Court for King County, Washington. This action arises out of an agreement entered into in 1981 under which SCP sold to Microsoft SCP's rights in a disk operating system, which Microsoft developed into MS-DOS, end quote. The prospectus goes on to say that the lawsuit alleges that, quote, SCP has an assignable, perpetual, royalty-free worldwide license from Microsoft for MS-DOS in its current and future versions, end quote. It then states that Seattle Computer Products was asking for, quote, damages believed to exceed $20 million or $60 million when trebled, or a rescission of the agreement, a return of the rights granted thereunder, and an accounting for the payment to SCP of all revenues received from Microsoft's marketing of MS-DOS, 
end quote. Now, investors at this time might not have worried about a lawsuit like this, but the figures mentioned were substantial. Damages of $60 million would be huge compared to Microsoft's $24 million of net income in the last full year. The suit also says that SCP wants a return of the rights of MS-DOS and a payment for all revenue received from MS-DOS. SCP might have been dreaming, and Microsoft ended up settling this lawsuit for a minor amount of money, so it wasn't a big deal at the end of the day. I just think that it's important to note that lawsuits like this can be forgotten about decades later, but the outcome maybe wasn't so obvious to all parties at the time of the IPO. Besides the lawsuit, there was a tax situation that had the potential to be meaningful to shareholders. The prospectus says, quote, In the course of a current examination of the years ended June 30th, 1983 and 1984 by the Internal Revenue Service, a field agent has proposed that Microsoft is subject to the Personal Holding Company Tax, PHC. The PHC tax is 50% of after-tax income and through December 31st, 1985, could be as much as approximately $30 million plus interest. At its option, a corporation subject to the PHC tax may declare a deficiency dividend to its stockholders of record at the time. At the time, such a dividend is declared in an amount equal to the corporation's undistributed PHC income. For Microsoft, this could be as much as approximately $60 million as of December 31st, 1985. The payment of a deficiency dividend avoids a PHC tax to the corporation, but is taxable to the stockholders. If a PHC tax were to be assessed and the company elected to pay the tax, the payment of tax would be recorded as a charge to operations and would reduce net income accordingly. If a PHC tax were to be assessed and the company elected to declare a deficiency dividend, retained earnings would be reduced by the amount of such dividend, end quote. Microsoft's net income was $24 million in its previous fiscal year. The lawsuit I mentioned earlier talked about $60 million in damages, and this personal holding company tax cites $30 million plus interest. So we're talking about $90 million plus interest here. That is a lot of money. Microsoft had just $38 million of cash before the IPO. The prospectus mentions that the company is looking to raise just under $40 million through the IPO process. The potential tax liability could wipe out a decent amount of the firm's cash reserves. The figures in the lawsuit and the potential tax liability were substantial however you want to look at it whether compared to the market capitalization, its net income, or its cash reserves. I'm sure there were questions about this from potential investors at the time of the IPO. Microsoft had $140 million of revenue and $24 million of net income in 1985, just before the IPO. The company just kept growing and growing. Five years later in 1990, Revenue amounted to $1.2 billion, along with profits of $279 million. Jump ahead a decade to 2000, and Microsoft had $23 billion of revenue and $9.4 billion of profits. After another decade, we come to $62 billion in sales and almost $19 billion in profits. In 2023, the firm had sales of $212 billion and profits of $72 billion. This is some ridiculous growth, both in terms of the growth rate and the length of time it has continued to grow. It is just incredible to see. Since the IPO, revenue has compounded at a rate of 21% per year, while net income compounded by 23%. This is over a 38-year period. It is hard to find too many years in which revenue failed to increase. Revenue declined by 3% in 2009 and by almost 9% in 2016. I don't have all the financials for between 1986 and 1989, but since 1990, there were only two years I could find where revenue declined. 
net income fluctuated a little more as there were some more years of profit declines. Some declines were pretty large as net income dropped by 27% in 2012. Overall though, this is a story of consistent growth from all angles. The company had profit margins of 17% in 1985, while that figure grew to 34% by 2023. There was consistency in many financial metrics. The return on equity is still impressive at 39% in 2023. This is especially impressive given the size of Microsoft with over $200 billion of capital today. All of this growth and excellent business performance has been through periods of rapid technological changes. Bill Gates and Microsoft got their start when the personal computer was a new phenomenon. Since that time, the internet has come along, followed by smartphones, the cloud, and several unique competitors. Microsoft didn't foresee every change and didn't capitalize on every new business opportunity. It would be crazy to expect them to do so. Yet, the company was able to pivot and adapt to several challenges and changes along the way. This is an extremely unique story, and the prospectus was an interesting read. And that's where I'm going to leave off for this annual report. In the next episode, I plan to take a look at some of the early annual reports of Sears Roebuck. I thought it would be interesting to study some of the great retailers of the past and see how the industry changed through the years. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks for listening.